party, you're still allowed to have lots of fun. Yeah. All right, we're on to uh, our next panel. This is the legal struggle, attorneys, plaintiffs, and prisoners. Um, I don't think we have any plaintiffs. We've got we've got a, we've got attorneys, we've got prisoners, and we have uh, some people that fall into both categories. All right, my name is Bill Panzer. Um, I'm an attorney. Uh, sometime, I think it was probably 1994. Um, I was working on forfeiture reform, and one of the persons that I was working with invited me to a meeting of uh, California Normal at Dennis Perone's house. And that was the first time I met Dennis. And this was shortly after the legislature had passed uh, the Mellow Bill, which was a uh, bill that allowed for prescription of medical cannabis. Uh, passed both houses of the legislature, and Governor Wilson vetoed it at the time, saying that uh, because it was a prescription, it, preempted, it could be preempted by federal law, because the feds decide about prescriptions. I kind of agreed with that. Um, and Dennis asked me if I'd be willing to take a look at the Mellow Bill and suggest some changes to put it back in again. I took a look at it and said, what I'd really like to do is to start from ground up and draft something. And in order to deal with the prescription issue, we came up with recommend or approve. Because a prescription is two things. It's one, it's explanation to the patient what you're supposed to do. And it's also instructions to the person behind the counter at Long's what to put in the bottle. Well, no one was going to Long's to get their cannabis prescription filled, so we didn't need that part of it. So by taking it out of prescription, we basically tried to insulate it from attack by the feds for preemption. So I drafted uh, something I thought we, we you know, set it around, people put their ideas on it, and that eventually became AB 1529, I think it was the uh, number, the Baskin-Sellis bill, which also passed both houses of the legislature and was again vetoed by Governor Wilson, and that laid the foundation to come back with Prop 215. Um, a lot I could talk about. I just, I'm, I'm just reminded, you know, I, I hadn't thought of this in years until I was sitting here today, but I remember during the campaign, I had been called to jury duty. Now, every lawyer that I know, every trial lawyer at least, wants to get on a jury. I would love to be on a jury. You know, I've sat on the other side of that door wondering what the jury's doing, but I've never been in there and I've always wanted to. And so they called me to jury duty in Alameda County where I was living. And it was a criminal case and it was a cannabis case. And I was one of the first 12 people they called up to the box. And they're doing voir dire, which is the lawyers and the judge ask questions and the, they decide who they want on their jury. Well, I knew there wasn't a chance in hell that I was going to get on a cannabis jury. You know, it just was not going to happen. So we're going along and I haven't said anything yet. You know, I'm, well, I'm, what do you do? I'm a lawyer. You know, that's it. Well, at one point, one I it was the district attorney or the, or, or the public defender, but one of them said, is anybody on this panel involved in any kind of uh, drug reform organizations, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving or anything like that? And I raised my hand. He calls on me. And I know I'm going to get to say one thing, and then they're getting me the hell out of here. So... This jury pool, I'm going to pollute it as much as I can. And I raise my hand and I say, I'm with a group called Friends of Prop 215. Prop 215 is an initiative that's going to be on the ballot this November to allow people to use medical cannabis to treat cancer and AIDS and glaucoma, and blah, 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 blah. And I finished. And I leaned over and started to pick my stuff up because I knew I was going to get bounced at that point. But before they could bounce me, someone else on the jury raised their hand. Some lady, she said, you know, my uncle has glaucoma. He uses marijuana for it. It really helps him. Someone else in the box raised their hand. My brother's fighting cancer. He uses marijuana. It really helps him. The jury, the, the DA sitting at his table, not gnashing his teeth. Boy, have I polluted this pool. And finally, when they were finished, the judge turns to Mr. District Attorney. Do you have any peremptory challenges? And I just picked up my stuff as I'm hearing, Mr. Panzer, thank you, you can leave. That's when I knew, holy shit, we're going to pass. You know, and 
I've met some incredible people in this movement. I mean, looking today, just around here, there's people I haven't seen in 25 years. Um, seems like, you know, the hair color's changed, the amount of hair has changed, a little bit more weight, whatever, but there's still a lot of us going strong, though looking at the memoriam, uh, it's just, it's sad looking at the memoriam. There's so many people there. Um, but I met Dennis. Oh, I remember meeting Brownie Mary. Now, Brownie Mary, I read about her. She was Mother Teresa of marijuana. She was this sweet old lady that helped the patients. That's what I thought from reading the papers. Well, those of you who knew her, that woman could curse so much she could make a sailor blush. She was wonderful, but she was full of piss and vinegar. I'll tell you, she was great. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and cut this short, maybe pick up some more time. So the first uh, speaker we're going to hear from, um, I met when um, I was working with uh, Alan Martinez, who was the, had been arrested. He eventually became the first uh, Prop 215 defendant. He was arrested prior to 215. His case was pending when 215 passed. And we met with uh, Bill Zimmerman and his crew down in uh, Santa Monica. And uh, they had a lawyer, Dan Abrahamson, who was a young, dynamic lawyer, who uh, I remember lo looking at him and thinking, yeah, it's probably me 10 years ago. So, um, and by the way, some of you may have noticed these little pins. These are 25th Anniversary Pioneer Award for Pop 215. And I'd like to present this to our first speaker, Dan Abrahamson. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. It's so lovely to be here amongst friends uh, and colleagues. Uh, and Bill, you're actually wrong about a plaintiff. There is a plaintiff here, and there's plaintiff Valerie Corral, who on the panel is not a plaintiff on the panel, but I'm bringing her on the panel now as part of what I'm about to say, because Valerie was instrumental in the case that I'm about to speak about uh, as a named plaintiff in the case of Conant v. Walters. So I'm just going to speak about that case because it's a sliver of the many legal cases that have come out of California that have really defined the rights around medical marijuana for the nation. And the Conant case ar arose when moments after Prop 215 passed in November of 1996, the federal government began making noises about how they could not permit Proposition 215 to stand, uh, at which point... Uh, Ethan Nadelman, uh, my boss at the Linda Smith Center, uh, and Bill Zimmerman, and many of the people you've seen today said, okay, we won this thing. How do we preserve this win? And they started looking to the lawyers, and they said, Dan, what next? Uh, and so I began gathering a brain trust of people around me to think about what is the federal government going to do, and what are they going to do, what are we going to do when they do whatever they're going to do? And it was a standoff for about six weeks. The federal government kept on making noise that 215 could not stand, but the federal government refused to sort of acknowledge or state what they were going to do against California. And during this time, the federal government gathered its brain trust of secretaries of everything in rooms to have discussions of how could they put California back to bed. Uh, and then in December, as you heard earlier, uh, the Secretary Shalala, General Barry McCaffrey, um, and various other government officials held a press conference and said, in all of their wisdom, we are going to prevent Proposition 215 from taking effect by preventing doctors from making recommendations or approvals, Bill Panzer's language, to patients. Because if physicians cannot recommend or approve medical marijuana, patients under the law cannot have the right to use or possess medical marijuana. So if we can silence doctors, we can stop the system. We had our lawsuit. As soon as they made that threat on camera to the nation, we realized we had a First Amendment case. Now, none of us expected to be First Amendment lawyers when we thought about medical marijuana and the drug war, but all of a sudden, First Amendment was front and center. And so I put together a legal team involving the ACLU of Northern California uh, with the attorney Ann Brick, who was a First Amendment specialist. I brought together civil rights attorneys from the law firm Al Schiller Burzon, Graham Boyd, uh, and Jonathan Weissglass, who are just brilliant federal civil rights litigators. 
And then uh, the group of us sat down and said, with our First Amendment case that we're going to bring, how are we going to bring it to persuade these federal judges to uphold the rights of physicians to recommend medical marijuana? And we assumed the outlook of the federal judges would be much the same as the outlook of the federal officials who opposed California's Prop 215. So we set together to put together a plaintiff class that could not help but be sympathetic to uh, these federal judges. And so my first move was to ask Valerie Corral to teach me everything she knew about medical marijuana and medical marijuana patients uh, and that was just an amazing uh, inculcation for me into the world of medical marijuana. And through her, I gained access to some amazing co-plaintiffs of hers, patients. Uh, and within that patient's class, two stand out as particularly useful to us in terms of the role that we wanted to play vis-a-vis -vis the federal judges. One, Joe Daly former San Francisco police commissioner, cancer patient who needed medical marijuana to take and survive her chemo. Second, Keith Vines, a deputy district attorney in San Francisco who prosecutes drug cases, suffers HIV and AIDS, needs medical marijuana in order to keep from wasting away so that he has enough strength to take his antiretroviral medications. Joe Daly, Keith Vines step up to the plate they agree to become patient plaintiffs, and there we are, standing in front of national TV cameras with a prosecutor who's a former Marine and a former police commissioner saying, we need this to survive. Terrifically courageous plaintiff patients. We then go to the physicians. Physicians are, by their nature, conservative beings. They do not want to put their neck out in the line of fire. They have a lot to lose, and yet, we had a series of physicians from the University of California, San Francisco, again with the help of uh, Dr. Abrams, who helped introduce us to many of these physicians, who agreed to put their names and their professional livelihoods on the line by stepping up and saying, we as physicians believe that our patients should at least be able to learn our best recommendations and our best advice about medical marijuana. Those physicians include Dr. Marcus Conant of national fame, international fame uh, for his work on HIV AIDS. Uh, it includes uh, Dr. Tripathi, uh, a cancer physician at UCSF who we knew had treated many of the judges in the Northern District of California on the federal, on the federal bench, uh, and Dr. Neil Flynn, a brilliant physician at UC Davis. And so when we went into court with these physicians and with these plaintiffs, we knew we had sympathetic ears with those judges, and indeed we did. In federal trial court, Judge Fern Smith gave the government for an hour a hard time saying, why would we possibly want and allow the federal government to put federal police officers in the exam room with physicians and their patients to listen to what's going on? That just shocks the conscience, and the government didn't have a response, and the judge was outraged, and she ruled in our favor, and she said, physicians have the right, free from federal government interference, to recommend medical, medical marijuana to their patients. We took that victory to the Ninth Circuit. Three judge panel there unanimously ruled the same way. We did not, when you finish an argument in front of a three judge panel in the federal circuit, you don't often know how that decision is gonna come out until weeks or months later when they actually issue the written decision. But on that day in that courtroom and then the three federal judges, at the end of the oral argument, federal judge uh, Alex Kaczynski stopped every, the proceedings before allowing the court to adjourn and said, is the lawyer who represented uh, the California physicians who filed their friend of the court brief in front of this court, is that lawyer in the room today, in the courtroom? That lawyer didn't happen to be present. And he goes, well, I would like somebody in this courtroom to go and tell that lawyer, thank you from the Federal Court of Appeals for filing one of the most informative friend of the court briefs ever filed in federal court, teaching us, teaching us federal judges, the history of medical marijuana and the medical basis for medical marijuana, that brief educated all of us, thank you. So with that, we had a sense that we had won this case. In the final few seconds I have left, I just need to zoom out for a second to say, we won the Conant case, that gave a green light. 
for California and then every other state in the nation has passed medical marijuana to do so using physician approval and physician recommendations to do that. But I also have to note that no other federal court in the country have made such a ruling. And the Supreme Court has never directly addressed this case. So for the last 25 years, as we've seen medical marijuana spread across the country, all based on the physician's right to recommend medical marijuana, that right rests in a fairly slim, perhaps precarious read of essentially four federal judges saying so 25 years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Uh, oh. I first met this guy. Both of us had dark hair back then. Uh, he was, for years you didn't want me to say this. I, say, I think it's okay now. I met him. He was sitting at a table on Telegraph Avenue um, selling cookies. I don't know what the uh, recipe was for those cookies, but Magic. they seemed to like him. Um, he then went on to become a director of the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Club, probably the best known buyers club nationally as the years went on. Uh, he was one of the defendants in the federal case that tried to shut the clubs down. Um, I've known him, shit, like 30 years. <laughs> Jeff Jones. And Jeff, also here is your Pioneer Award. Um, yeah, so honored to be here today and necessarily didn't do this to get an award. Um, what got me into this was having a dad pass away from cancer when I was 13, living in South Dakota. And you can see where we've come since then, that it just took us a couple of years ago to change the law in South Dakota. And they, they jumped the horse. They went from medical use right to adult use. And it didn't take me being there because I expatriated the state because of Brownie Mary, because of Dennis Perone being in the news and showing a path of hope to get something done. Because I came at this fundamentally from the grassroots level, uh, trying to make connections with patients, connections with physicians that you heard about earlier. And some fundamental foundation occurred that we changed the rule set from a being a prescription base into a recommendation. And with the likes of Bill Panzer and Robert H, we created a new animal. And instead of calling it marijuana, we called it medical cannabis or medical marijuana. And we had some auspices there, Dr. Todd and others that tried to put that on the map years ago, but it didn't really tactically stick until we passed Prop 215, which is what brought us all here today. And the thing that makes me just pivotal is that where we've come so far, that we can imagine that we're still controlling the plant, we're still allowing patients to cultivate it in their home. And only one of the states that's passed medical and now adult use doesn't allow you to home cultivate. And that might change because of us, because of us pushing farther. So I went on to do things that <clears throat> I think brought me out of being a defendant named in a, in a dispensary case that helped to educate the Department of Justice, the public, uh, on the state's rights levels that we still exist in today. I wake up every morning and I pinch myself being the father of three, uh, having a, a happy, healthy family. And I never thought we'd still have cannabis be illegal federally with the paradigm that we exist in. You know, and, and we saw gay marriage get banned with Prop 8 here in California that then triggered the review in the legal system that went before one of our friendly uh, judges that overturned it and then triggered the whole overturn of it federally because that involved empowering rights fundamentally of people. And we are doing the same thing, but because we carry the image of being pro-drug, it's hard because you don't know how many snickers I got, how many puns of the joke I was when I showed up at different events because I was a, a dealer more or less in the day and how hard it was for me to get support. But once I sawed off all my hair and put on a suit, everything changed. And that, that was legal strategy back then, because I wasn't doing that day one. Uh, as Bill met me out on the street corner of Telegraph Avenue selling Magic 50s, I'm glad that I didn't get charged with anything back then, because that might have changed my trajectory. But it wouldn't have changed the outcome that we all are sharing today, because we struggled with this as a team. 
And I think the thing that I try to do daily is make sure that we're empowering others that are around us. I still teach at Oxford University that my wife runs and we teach people around the world. Because while we're not struggling in California with legal cannabis, there are some states that still have trouble, like Idaho, where hemp isn't even legal yet. But, you know, I mean, to give a former president his flower, not that I want to be controversial today, but politics is part of this map. Trump did more for this plant than a lot of other past presidents. And I'm speaking from being sued by President Clinton. And my, my case broke the day Lewinsky gave broke. Okay? And I shared that with five other people. And only one club didn't get named in, into a defendant because the defendant, the runner of that club, is an older gentleman that looked like Santa Claus in a wheelchair. And we soon saw why they chose not to target that. And we took advantage of that. We tried to get involved with people that would most tell the story of why we were doing this, what risk we were taking. And I think where we're at today is so hopeful. I mean, it, to see some fundamental changes, even in the Democratic Party in California, where when we tried to put together Prop 19 to reform the adult use laws, a lot of maybe boos and hisses because people didn't think it was a very good written law, we had a ballot argument written against us. Does anybody know who authored that in the voter handbook? Our current vice president. Remember that. And that's something that we don't think about. But we moved her. We moved everybody around her. And that, right now, what's interesting is she's our best hope right now for federal change. Because you look to her boss and it's hopeless. Because he's from the old guard that believes we shouldn't have the right to do this and we deserve treatment if we pick this up. And that's where I continue to want to struggle and be an advocate and push this in front of people's faces, sometimes in a very uncomfortable way. You know, I got a multitude of arguments where I didn't get asked back to the dinner table because uh, I was loudmouth and I wanted to make this heard. And even though I carry the nickname of being quiet crusader in Oakland, California, that didn't stop me from making big waves. And one of the biggest waves was just being named a federal defendant, you know, and that wasn't necessarily a choice, but I could see it coming. I knew what I was getting involved in, how big it was, and it was larger than me. But I'm also a recovering jury tamperer. <laughs> so all the stuff that I did with medical cannabis, I never got arrested. I never served time. But I almost went to prison for three months because of being a jury tamperer in federal prison, actually. Sacramento involved with a, a case, Brian Epis, where I went to the court and sat down in front of the judge. And by the time I sat down, I knew I was going to be in trouble. And I, had, I told my friend that I needed to go to the restroom. And before I got to the restroom, I was accosted by the DEA because they had picked up the gist that I had more or less littered everybody coming into the courthouse that day with a pretty good synopsis of what Brian Epis's case was to me. And I tainted 30 out of the 45 jurors. I gave it to the U.S. attorney that was prosecuting the case on his way into work that morning. Four, four of the U.S. Marshals had to deal with it as an evidential issue. And while I was being arrested that day, I got pulled aside and got into a holding tank and was talked to by a public defender that I don't really remember her name. So I can't talk to you about the case. And I'm like, OK, what are you going to talk to me about? It's anything but the case. And I'm like, so why am I here? And she's like, I can't talk to you about this. And I'm like, so how's the weather? And we just started talking about stuff. And she's like, why I'm holding you here is they were talking about moving you to the county jail right now. And if we're sitting here talking and you don't interrupt yourself by doing something about the case, we're going to sit here long enough that you jump over that little hump and you get to sit here. And I'm like, oh, great. So is it going to rain? And we just kept talking and talking. And then all of a sudden they came in and they figured out what we were doing. And it was already too late. And I was like, and that's kind of what I always wanted to do with the system is throw a wrench in it just enough to make make things happen. And I think part of the legacy of what I want to leave with today is that we still have a lot of work to do because we're not there yet. Federally, if we don't change the rule set, we're all still criminals. And if we can remove the, the rule set here, it changes the international level. And because Trump made hemp legal, unscheduled it, he opened up the paradigm that we're now talking about making cannabis unscheduled. Before that happened, we could not talk about it being anything less than Schedule 3. And that, to me, is super important that we remove the scheduling status from it because the plant can't be free to home cultivate with scheduling on it. And it doesn't deserve it. It was incorrectly placed there by Nixon, and we shouldn't accept it as part of our legacy. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, our next speaker... 
Um, are we going by the list or are we just going down the table? Um, let's go by the list, okay, because actually this ties in. Um, back when Jeff's club, along with uh, five other clubs in Northern California, were uh, charged by the feds, they were sued civilly. Um, initially, one other lawyer and I um, were the first ones to get it because we just were the closest to the people involved. Other lawyers came in and stuff, but this guy, you know, we weren't getting paid or anything at this point. And this guy um, just busted his ass and went on to, in fact, uh, represent uh, medical cannabis in front of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Rob, why don't you come on up? Rob H. And also very deserving of the Pioneer Award. There you go. I thank you. I'm so glad to be here on this wonderful celebration after 25 years to the day of when uh, we really started the ball rolling on an international basis, not just nationally. Uh, representing Jeff Jones in the case that went to the Supreme Court, the issue that was ruled upon had to do with medical necessity, a doctrine that has come down to us uh, from the common law, from ancient England centuries ago. Um, and we lost at the district court. We won at the Ninth Circuit, which let the Oakland Cannabis Buyers Cooperative have a, a reprieve for a little bit of time to provide cannabis to patients who met medical necessity. And then we eventually lost that at the Supreme Court on a three to five vote. Uh, the reason we lost it at the Supreme Court was medical necessity could not be applied, according to the court, to a third party such as a dispensary. So we went back to the drawing board and found a case that had have some individual patients and caregivers. Um, one of the, uh, the plaintiffs in that case was Diane Monson in Butte County, who was growing six simple cannabis plants, medical cannabis plants in her yard. One day she got visited by a multi-jurisdictional task force of um, narcotics officers from the Butte County Sheriff's Office and the DEA, thinking they were gonna come there to uh, steal her six medical cannabis plants and arrest her, et cetera. Turns out her six plants were actually legal under Prop 215 that we're celebrating today. So what we saw then was some of those uh, law enforcement officials switch sides instead of being in cahoots with the DEA, they went over to the other side and were um, defending Diane Monson's uh, six plants from these other uh, law enforcement officials from the DEA. The uh, district attorney for the county got on the phone with the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of California, and a three-hour standoff ensued there. Um, when they ever make the movie about um, uh, legalization and uh, uh, high points along the way, this particular scene is going to be one of the most dramatic scenes in there when Diane Monson was actually seeing the civil war breaking out in, in her yard among two different heavily armed officials fighting each other uh, from different agencies. Um, the uh, another plaintiff was Angel Rach, um, who uh, had two caregivers. Those two caregivers were providing cannabis to Angel for free. Um, it was all taking place in Oakland. Diane Monson's plants all were taking place in her own yard. Uh, no money was exchanged for this. Now, the Controlled Substances Act was passed by Congress under its uh, authority in the Constitution under the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress's power to, uh, quote, regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes, unquote. So if uh, there's no commerce involved, if there's no interstate activity whatsoever, the argument is Congress couldn't prevent medical cannabis that's not even in commerce that never crossed state boundaries at all. Um, it was all wholly intrastate. 
that's what the case was about. Nevertheless, we had a majority of the case, of the justices, six uh, of the nine, uh, who just didn't like those facts. So Justice Stevens, writing for the court, went outside the facts that we presented in the opinion of the court and said, well, who cares about all these facts about no interstate commerce? We nevertheless are going to interpret the Commerce Clause so broadly. They, so this became the case involving cannabis that for decades is going to be looked at, sadly, by law students as the apex, the pinnacle of the broadest extent of federal power under the Commerce Clause. Uh, Justice Connor, uh, O'Connor, in writing a dissent for three justices in the Supreme Court, pointed out that fact to Justice Stevens that he was going beyond the facts in the case. And Clarence Thomas uh, wrote his own wonderful dissent in the case. No matter how you may feel about Clarence Thomas on various issues, when it came to this medical cannabis issue, he wrote the wonderful dissent. And just recently, on June 28th of 2021, in another case altogether, Justice Thomas wrote another statement where he essentially says, you know, I was right back uh, 16 years ago in 2005 in the Raich case uh, when I told you that was the wrong decision that the majority of the case uh, of the court came to. That was a 280E case that he happened to deny cert with, but he said the federal policy since then is not consistent with the Controlled Substances Act, and therefore this doesn't make sense, and you really should have listened to me as Justice Thomas back in 2005. He was basically doing a uh, victory lap, um, and saying I was right. Uh, it's one little part of the, uh, the case that uh, it hasn't gotten too much attention that I would like to tell you about a little bit with this, the through line from the OCBC case in the Supreme Court. That was about medical necessity. So on remand, back to the Ninth Circuit, from the Supreme Court in 2007, we got a ruling from the Ninth Circuit on medical necessity, saying that yes, if you are an individual patient meeting medical necessity uh, qualifications, then you can invoke the medical necessity defense uh, in a criminal case. And that has become binding authority in the Ninth Circuit on medical necessity. It's persuasive authority anywhere in the country with respect to an interpretation of federal law. But that's what we did, having seen Jeff Jones being able to deny the win he should have gotten in the Supreme Court on medical necessity, that it nevertheless came back like a ping pong ball that at least in another case could make sure that all patients everywhere knew that they have the right, to this day have the right under federal law to invoke the medical necessity defense. So we still got a victory even in the long run at the end. You know, Rob mentioning that standoff reminded me, and I'll just very quickly, one of my favorite stories out of this whole movement is uh, numerous years ago, uh, Valerie and Mike Corral in Santa Cruz were raided by the DEA. And Mike and Valerie were taken in their pajamas to the DEA's uh, headquarters in San Jose. And when the word got out, the members of WHAM came to the grow area in wheelchairs and crutches and old people, and they blocked the road so the DEA couldn't get out. And the DEA, as I understand it, the DEA contacted the uh, Santa Cruz Sheriff and said, we need help. And the Sheriff said, what? You guys can't get past old people in wheelchairs? Tough. <laughs> and there was a standoff and it was finally agreed that the patients would let the DEA agents go and the DEA would let Valerie and Mike go. All right, so our, our next speaker. Um, <laughs> as a lawyer, I've often said this to people and I'm sure the other lawyers in this room have many, said it many times too. Um, there's an old saying, when you represent yourself, you have a fool for a client. 
no one should ever represent themselves. And I still believe that. But there's an exception that proves the rule. And that's our next uh, Pioneer Award winner, Pebbles Trippett. Is this okay? Yes. What my wonderful community. So happy to see everybody together. I'm not sure I can keep this under seven minutes, but I'm going to really work on it. So I've taken a lot out. If anybody wants to read other things that I would have said, please ask me. Um, <clears throat> in my opinion, Prop 215, the Compassionate Use Act, ended prohibition of medical cannabis <clears throat> and is the most historic achievement of the century. Nothing else suppress, surpasses it in impact. <clears throat> and what's more, it, it, it turned a negative, that is the AIDS epidemic, of the 80s and 90s into a positive, benefiting all of society. Um, this shows the transformative power of crisis. What's more, it established the voters as the heroes of the community. I think without the voters and without Dennis having the savvy to, to leap over the legislature and go directly to the voters, we would still be under conditions of prohibition. And so an equally significant is the turnaround in a single generation of support on the part of the public to medical purposes. It's at 90% now. At last poll I read was 92%. Is there anything in the country that 90% of people agree on? Or maybe that you need water to survive, whatever it is, <laughs> the voters have proven, and the, and the polls pretty much go for the same people, that those are the people we can't do without. We can do without the legislature. If I can leap over the legislature, we'll be a lot better off. And so, um, Uh, to start this out, a team of visionaries, that is Brownie Mary, Dennis Perone, and Dr. Todd McCorea, ended a century of prohibition. We can also honor Valerie Corral. But he didn't say what for. <laughs> we should honor her for having added cultivation to the initiative. And had she not said, I will not endorse it if you do not add cultivation to the text of the proposition, it would still be just possession, obtain, and use. And so Valerie saved us <laughs> from regret forever with the fourth medical right, so it's possess and cultivate, obtain and use, and then the People versus Trippet case came along and added transport. The, the, the purpose of 
of the case was to keep it simple, and that is to transport simply means not that you're smuggling, but that you're just carrying the medicine that you can otherwise possess and cultivate. Like any other medicine. And the court said, mm, you're right. When I put it that way, they know exactly what's going on. It's just that we're not aware of what they're aware of. Um, I, I also wanted to add about the Trippett case, for, for what it's worth, that um, I, I was, I was, I had 10 busts in 11 years in four counties, and in jail in four of them. And every time I lost, starting in 1990, long before the initiative passed, I appealed. On what basis did I appeal? I appealed on constitutional grounds because I didn't have any statutory grounds. Prop 215 hadn't passed yet. And so as a result of appealing on constitutional grounds, I got a benefit. And that is that they couldn't throw the case out after I lost on appeal at the first level. Every lawyer knows this. They always throw every case out after you lose your appeal at the appeals court level. Oh my goodness. Uh, and, so, and so I would recommend that lawyers started doing what I did. And that was to add constitutional grounds. For medical, it's illegal search, seizures of medicine. It's obvious, right? Unequal protection compared to other drugs. Why not add that? I also added it's cruel to punish a medical act because it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I knew I wouldn't get anywhere. <laughs> Well, I, I feel like the future is not, we're not prepared for the future. We're just satisfied to say, mm, well, so be it, sort of like, because the government is very powerful. And I feel that the medical cannabis community should be demanding due process rights to medical use under compassionate use or we'll withdraw without them. We will not stand in line and let them fleece us as they co-opt our knowledge. The knowledge base is just disappearing. <coughs> and the main problem is Governor Newsom. And I, I feel like we need to do something about this rather than stay silent, which is that he, he has combined medical and recreational into a unified whole, which means that medical people are subject to pesticides. Washington State did the same thing and they're sub subject to 200 pesticides. And it's if we don't separate medical, if we don't insist to be separated, Newsom is on his way to merging them for quote, administrative convenience. So administrative convenience takes priority over <laughs> statutory rights and constitutional rights because we're silent about it and we're letting him do it and we should stop him from doing it by speaking out from every corner before he passes that law because once you pass a law, it's a lot harder to undo it. So I'm, I, I'm done, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pe Pebbles had a case where uh, she was uh, arrested for transporting, um, and this is prior to 215, but she was able to keep the case alive and on appeal, and while it was appending, 215 passed. And the first time they went up for oral argument, uh, she had a court appointed lawyer who didn't even know that the statute would apply retroactively. 
and he was somewhat chastised by the, both the court and by Pebbles, who knew that it would. <laughs> but what I always enjoyed was that lawyer, I've never met him, but his name was Randall Stoner. Okay, our, our next speaker also gave up the ultimate for this movement. She gave up years of her life in federal prison. And to show you how disgusting this drug war was, it wasn't anything she did. Her partner was involved in dealing drugs. And I think, what, you took phone messages or just mild stuff? Basically, the deal was he cut a deal, he rolled on her, he went free, and she went to prison. She's also uh, was the, I believe, the, the cover photo on the uh, on, on Mickey on uh, Chris and Mickey's book, Human Rights. Hey, our next speaker, Amy Pova. I also present you with a Pioneer Award. Oh my gosh, I, uh, I feel like I'm in the company of giants and this is such an incredible family. We all are pieces of this mosaic and sometimes you find your purpose and it's not what you ever dreamed. And uh, I found my purpose when the feds busted into my home up in the Hollywood Hills and told me I'd either cooperate or serve 20 to life. And um, my story is all over the place, so I don't want to dwell on my story. I just want to thank Dale and Ellen Comp, who, my God, Ellen, um, you put so much work into this. Mickey and Chris, um, like Bill Panzer said, put me on the cover of Shattered Lives. I would not have gotten out of prison if it weren't for the act, uh, advocacy of so many people who are in this room. And this guy right here uh, came and visited me in prison. You know, there's no money in post-conviction whatsoever. But uh, Virginia Resner, who, and, and thank you, was the first person to come in and visit me in prison and my first advocate. And um, she asked Bill Panzer to come visit me. I think it was because I, I um, had a double jeopardy for a little minute um, motion that uh, because he came and visited me, uh, once, and, and, and there really wasn't much, much follow-up because the double jeopardy then, the Supreme Court reversed itself, and uh, that's a, a different story. But uh, I got put on a list to be transferred to Tallahassee, and you have no control over that. You're just shipped around like we're cattle. And because he had visited me, um, he wrote a letter, and he said, that is my client. I need her to stay in Dublin. And I was the only person in Dublin that they made an exception for. And my case manager made a big deal about it. You're the only one we're making an exception for. So if it weren't for the act, kind acts of so many people who are here in this room, um, I, um, my life would be even, you know, much different than, than what it is. I received clemency from President Clinton in great part because of Shattered Lives. And that was funded by a grant from DPA and uh, Marsha had my picture in her office at the Linda Smith Center. I didn't know that until your office moved and I was invited to take control of the Human Rights 95 exhibit. And I just wanna say that we're, we're all just part of this mosaic and, and contributing to this huge picture. And mine just happens to be that because I got clemency from President Clinton, I was compelled to start the Can Do Foundation. Um, that stands for clemency for all nonviolent drug offenders, um, but there wasn't much energy for clemency during the Bush Jr. administration. So you're feeling like you're just spinning your wheels and not accomplishing much. And I think all of us want some little piece of our work to outlive us. And I wanted something tangible to prove that I, I, I was doing something in this movement. So I decided to do a documentary about marijuana. I was going to do one about the drug war, but um, Kevin Booth came out with his and marijuana, it's much, you know, I transitioned into, okay, let's focus on a marijuana and then marijuana documentary. And you can get much more people to watch a documentary about marijuana than, than other drugs. 
And that's when I started learning about uh, the benefits of medical marijuana. I also learned about people who were serving life for pot. I thought I knew everything about the drug war because I studied it for the nine years that I served on my 24 year sentence. But because of uh, Beth Curtis's work, her brother was serving a life sentence. I, I, I was like, what? Oh my God. And so I had to change my documentary because I wanted to put something in there about the pot lifers. And I really want to underscore the insanity that is going on when we are in an era where people are making billions off the cannabis industry while simultaneously there are people who are serving a life sentence without parole. And it's, it's not even a life sentence. I prefer calling it a death sentence. These people will die in prison for cannabis if we don't come together as a community, as a whole, and demand that this barbaric practice end. They are serving time. The, uh, these people are serving time not only for a plant that we're all probably have done some today, we'll be doing some later, we have the freedom to do it every single day, but during a pandemic. And I don't know if you guys can even fathom what it's like, but I'm reliving my PTSD every day through core links and emailing people in prison and hearing about how they're under lockdown status, they can't make phone calls, they can't have visits. They're scared to death they're gonna die from COVID. And our government, made up in great part of leaders who don't have the spine or the backbone to, to live up to their campaign promises to free all the marijuana prisoners. They brag about smoking pot when they're on the campaign trail. They brag about inhaling because that makes them relatable. That makes them, uh, uh, they, they're, gar you know, they're pandering to a vote. And I have been on two, I've been on a couple of Zooms with White House counsel with the Biden administration. And I pressed them because it's a, a Zoom about clemency. I pressed them about their promises for the marijuana prisoners. And I just get this um, in deflection of, well, uh, we're, we're going to focus on the CARES Act prisoners first. And, and, and this is just the first step. But it's going to take all of us with all of our weight to end this insanity. Because you all remember John Lennon did the song about John Sinclair. Well, he only got 50 years. And that was so offensive back then. The fact that people are serving a life sentence without parole right now while we all enjoy this plant is to me one of the most shameful moments in our entire history. And it's also a flaw on the human species that, has, that doesn't have the logic or the backbone of our leaders that we elect. And I wish all of you would pressure our leaders in DC and, and let them know that it's not acceptable. Last thing, when I was doing my documentary, I got to meet Dale Sky Jones and Jeff when we were all marching to the Obama headquarters because Oaksterdam had been raided. And so I'm not blue, I'm not blue or red. I am not a political creature. We just have to hold accountable whoever we vote for, whether it's on the blue or the red side, I don't care. But I love you and I really feel I'm part of a beautiful family here. I really do. And I want to honor everyone here because we're all bringing our knowledge and pebbles. My God, you can talk to me after this for hours because I am so moved by your story. And thank you so much. I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Bill. Our next speaker uh, qualifies as both a uh, patient and a defendant. Uh, he and uh, his partner, who is a medical doctor, had a clinic in cool California. Definitely one of the coolest names for a place I've ever heard. Um, they were brave. You know, it's, 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 it's brave. You can imagine it's brave to open up a place in Oakland like Jeff Jones or in San Francisco like Dennis, but imagine opening a place out in the rural, the hinterlands, where the local, po you know, the police and the politicians are not nearly as, as woke as they are in the Bay Area. Um, they were arrested. He also did time in prison for the plant. And now Dale Schaefer.
And Dale, I'm very proud to present you with your Pioneer Award. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I can't remember the first time we met, but it's been at least a couple of decades, at least a couple of decades. Uh, I am a practicing attorney and a convicted federal drug felon. And I had a license to practice law while I was in federal prison. And I had SIS up my ass with a microscope probably every day thinking I'm doing, I must be doing something nefarious um, because I wasn't charging people. People cooked me a lot of good stuff. I ran the gardens and food grew wings and legs and made it up to the dorms and people cooked for me. I figured it out like I was in the military. I was not part of the um, build up to 215. I was practicing law. I was married to a physician. I'd been trained in medicine. I'd worked through uh, emergency and trauma medicine for undergrad and walked right into medical malpractice work, which is very conservative. Um, I mean, very conservative. But I've been smoking weed for 50 years, and Molly, my, my wife, had to. We just never thought about it. Well, the medicine and, and law were conservative practices. You don't let people know you smoke weed. You just didn't. We all did, but you didn't talk about it. Uh, and then cancer came to our world. My youngest was five. And, and there was a wake up. It's like, holy shit, you're going to lose your hair. You're going to give, you know, you're going to not eat. We know what this is. We were both trained in this. We knew you're taking horrible chemo and smoking weed's the best thing you can do. So we went to her oncologist and said, we just passed this law. What the hell is this? And literally you could hear his ass snap shut like a cigar cutter. I, 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 I can't put that in writing for you. What? Why? So he gave Molly a prescription for Marinol, kept us out of jail. I mean, we, we played games with a recommendation approval. Can you just, you know, make a little mention, asterisk? I, I talked about weed and the medical record. Is that enough? It was a game we all played because getting caught growing weed in those days was a felony. Okay, 97, just after this, everyone's looking at felonies. And she needed weed, and it was four grand a pound. And I did that a couple of times. I went, <laughs> I'm doing pretty well in my practice, but this is crazy. And grew some weed. Someone rats us out. I got plants on the hillside. I can grow a weed. It's not that tough. Backstory, I used to represent cops. My first job was working for a law firm that was inside law enforcement politics. I've worked with them, and I've represented them. So I had an idea of the things they did, good and especially bad, inside law enforcement. And we'd, we'd volunteered our time for the courts and the cops, and they knew us, and they showed up and showed them the bottle, and it's like, you know who we are. And they said, well, Molly, and that was her name, Molly, uh, we know you. If you examine people and tell us who's really legit, we'll believe them. And please put it in writing for us and be available to talk to us, because everybody tells us they're a medical patient. We spend all these hours running down. They're not. It's like, okay. And she said, look, I'm a doctor, not a cop. So I'll practice law. I mean, I'll practice medicine and you go out and enforce the laws. Don't cross them over. And that was cool until she gave someone a recommendation they didn't like. And then it was on like Donkey Kong because I knew the system. I never handled criminal cases. I tried malpractice cases. Okay, I didn't know anything about that. I talked doctor and here we are in the middle of this. And the first person I met really was Todd. He took me under his wing. We just started this group. He hired me as their attorney because I'm a malpractice attorney. I've been the medical board doctors. Help us out. It just so happened that Dave D'Alba, who was the, um, uh, the AG's front man for marijuana, I tried a case with. I had his female CHP officer sued the misogynist leaders of the CHP. Another story. But um, we ran into lock here. He said, go talk to Dave D'Alba. We went right to the medical board. And I ran into this. David Thornton, who is a chief enforcement officer. We we're looking for guidelines. What do doctors do? I mean, I'm thinking, how do we keep doctors out of trouble? And uh, Thornton said, I'm after Todd. It's like being in a room. I'm an old white dude where you got misogynist, racist white guys that are behind a door and they'll finally tell you how they really feel. And it's like, oh, so Todd's my friend. I'm going to go tell him. Last time I ever got to be involved in this because now you're not inside law enforcement anymore. They started after us. We followed Jeff's case. When Jeff's case came out and there's a medical necessity defense, we were seeing patients. We had 5,000 patients. Some of them were critically ill. How do you help somebody? Well, I threw some plants in my hillside. They all signed paperwork. The cops looked at them. It's cool that they were keeping track for the feds. And when the feds rolled in just after 9-11, I don't know, I had 30 plants on my hillside. 
but over three years, I got a little over 100. And they informed us that 100 plants is five years. So well, I never had 100 plants. Well, if you do the math, <laughs> you did. So we got up to our eyeballs. Um, they went after Meta Molly's prescribing, federal prescribing license right away. It was gone because she'd been touching the plant. The medical board made three runs at her, finally lost her license. But when I was convicted, I had to get suspended and Jerry Brown was the AG and we said, well, you know, we don't see any moral turpitude here. Yeah, I got a felony, but you know, light sheet or steel, this is political bullshit. And I was suspended for one year from practice for getting a, fel a felony. Um, and I actually had my license turned on when I was still at Taft. <laughs> I didn't do anything with it. I thought I could get out and practice and they wouldn't let me. I was on, I did five years and I was supposed to have four years of paper. And with the help of um, Omar, I got off of that early and I was allowed to go really back to practice. And I'm in this right now. I'm building projects around the state. I see the horse shit going on at the political level. I just met with some cops. They are ideologues. Drugs are gonna ruin society and they can stop every project in the hinterland. And that's where I live. Okay, so I was always sort of an outsider coming over here going, how do you guys get this done? Because they'll shoot you over there for weed. Okay, how do we do this? And I'm still sort of that guy. And one of the first things I learned to do was from, from Chris Conrad is let's do the math off this bullshit DEA study about how much weed you get from, you know, some part of plant. We testified in front of juries to keep people from going to prison because they had a couple of 10 plants in their backyard and mom's got cancer. That's the stuff we had to deal with. So I like to look at what we've accomplished, but the compass heading is still towards, this should not be regulated like it's uranium. It should not, okay? Uh, Molly's part of a medical family that's been practicing medicine for 150 years. They used it until 1937, it's taken away. Her dad's a psychiatrist, her grandfather was a physician, parents go all the way back. They knew, give it to people, they tell you it works. Shit, pretty simple, I don't need, you know, 13 levels of studies to tell me that if I smoke weed, it helps your PTSD if you're a veteran. Sue Cecily did this. God love her. She went through the turmoil of being thrown out and all that stuff to say, you're a veteran with PTSD. If you smoke weed, it'll probably make you feel better. We all knew it, but now we can go to court and actually say it. That's the nonsense we're still dealing with. And Pebbles is right. You got to pound. You got to pound. We have not fixed the problem yet. Medical's basically dead. And it's got to be revived. It's too expensive. Thank God for Sweet Leaf. And I'm general counsel for Weed for Warriors. And on their board, we try to give away weed around the state as much as we can. It doesn't fix the problem. It just doesn't fix the problem. And it's so simple. But yet, ideologically, the social contract still supports the laws supported by ideologues who think weed's going to ruin the world. So thank you much. Uh, I'll chat with you later. Man that speaks his mind. And, uh, you know, I, I, he's, he's right up there on, on Mount Potmore with Dennis and Brownie Mary and the others. Uh, definitely a very, very well-deserving winner of a Pioneer Award, Ed Rosenthal. Thank you so thank you so much. Well, you know, I too am a marijuana. Well, I was a marijuana uh, medical patient for uh, quite a long time, and the first time that I uh, got a prescription or recommendation it was from Todd Micaria, and he said that I had PTSD and sh I should never be without marijuana. So that went on for a few years, but Todd died. Uh, there's a little thing, don't become my doctor, they tend to die off. So my next doctor said, no, you don't have PTSD, you have latent glaucoma. Now, you know, late, you can't tell about latent glaucoma, and the only way you'd find out is by not using marijuana and then you'd have irreparable eye damage if you do have the latent glaucoma. So just as a safety precaution, you have to use it constantly. 
Well, that doctor moved away. And so I went to see uh, Mike Alkalay, and he uh, gave me a recommendation and said that I had, I don't know why he said this, but that I had mocking and disruptive behavior. <laughs> now, he didn't say whether using marijuana would exacerbate that behavior <laughs> or moderate it. But nevertheless, I accepted that. And then I was in Colorado the day that uh, they uh, legalized medical marijuana uh, uh, by ballot. And that's when I realized marijuana was a miracle drug because I didn't have to use it anymore for medicine. It had cured all my uh, symptoms. So, Then, um, you know, I wanted to say a little bit about my uh, trial. Well, first of all, never fuck with a yippie. Right. Right. It just uh, doesn't do the government any good to do it. And, uh, uh, you know, I have a new book out, and uh, 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 Angela Baca, who is a co-author of the book, said that she didn't understand my trial completely until she saw the trial of the uh, Chicago 7. And certainly, it was some of the same characters in both of those trials. So uh, in terms of people who knew each other and from the Yippie thing, and the thing about Yippies is when freedom is outlawed, only outlaws will be free. And it's like that. And unlike other uh, liberal progressive organizations. It didn't accept money from government grants or other, uh, you know, uh, f uh, from uh, uh, private charities. We earned our money one way or another. And usually you earn your money in something that you're really interested in. So the Yippies had a constant source of being able to support themselves rather than begging for money. Okay, now I don't want to get into the trial too much, but there are a couple of things that I want to say. First of all, it, uh, the trial went that way because of many of the people, who, the way it did because of many of the people who are in the audience today. And uh, th that, that it had this total public exposure was, um, you know, was really important. And then the second thing about the trial was that we, uh, that we had a, uh, a, a different attitude. And that was, I knew that I was not going to go to prison. Now, I know a lot of prisoners know that, knew that too before trial, but uh, that carried me through. But now here's the important thing that I want to talk about. All of this, and we've been all talking about the past, but it isn't about the past, it's what Amy was really talking about, which is a future. There should be nobody in prison for marijuana, period, <laughs> period. Not for life, not for a year, not for three months, not even overnight. Nobody in prison, that's number one. And then the second thing is that you know, people complain about the prices. I don't care about the prices as long as people have the right to grow their own. And especially in California, where we have an imperfect law that fractionalizes a state. So if I'm in one county, I can grow. Or in one city, I can grow. And in the other city, I have to grow in my apartment or something, even though I might have acreage outdoors. And it's just unfair. And so are the plant counts unfair. We have to do it by canopy, not by plant count. So somebody who's growing 100 little plants shouldn't be treated the same way as someone who's growing 100 big plants and do it by canopy so that people are treated more fairly in terms of legalization. And the other thing is that there, we have to have more giveaway and more farmers markets. 
and especially these farmers markets. But the main thing is get the people out of prison. And you know, I would like to say that Steve D'Angelo, also another yippie, you know, we're not yippies anymore. I think we're even past mates, which would be the middle age independence party. But we should, uh, but uh, he had, he started uh, uh, the um, organization to get uh, uh, people out of prison. And it, it is it, last prisoner project. And it is so important and is doing such effective work that everybody should volunteer for it in one way or another. And there are two ways to volunteer. And I know a lot of people here are settled in life. And it's one way is to give your time. And if you don't want to give your time, give your money. It's one of the two. But every prisoner deserves to be free. And we don't deserve to just applaud ourselves for what we've done in the past. I mean, it's considerable. We change the laws all over the world, but we have to get the prisoners out of prison. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And uh, we got one more speaker, and then we'll, we'll schedule for a 420 break. Um, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> But, you know, there's other times are good, too. What can I say? Uh, our last speaker um, also, unfortunately, uh, had to spend time behind bars. Um, again, this is someone who opened up a compassionate club, not in San Francisco, not in Oakland, but out in the hinterlands in Southern California, where uh, politically it's... Uh, you know, it, it's, it's somebody said earlier today that like everybody they've met always believes they're right. I think in this organization, most of us believe we're left. But uh, and where where he was, there wasn't uh, there wasn't a left place. It was a right place. Um, so again, also a winner of a Pioneer Award, uh, Aaron Sandusky. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. I, uh, I recently got out of prison, federal prison. Uh, I just recently got out of prison uh, and out of the BOP uh, custody on March of 2020, uh, serving a 10-year sentence uh, for cultivation and distribution of marijuana, just in time for the lockdown for uh, COVID. But if anybody was ready for lockdown, it was me. You know what I mean? I mean, I just got to, if nothing else, I had a better bunkie this time, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, my case was one that uh, was, uh, we were a legal me medical marijuana shop in Upland, California. And we were challenging the, the uh, zoning rights. You know, many of the uh, cities were zoning out the businesses during that time in the state of California. And they were circumventing the, the laws of the state that the people passed by using zoning laws. And we challenged that in our case, went to the California Supreme Court in uh, 2012. It was uh, accepted by the California Supreme Court. But wild in, in getting there uh, was quite a challenge. Uh, you know, we uh, soon after we opened and uh, we were sued by the city. And then uh, one of the things that happened in the city was the Upland mayor who was uh, arrested for shaking down businesses. We were one of them. So uh, shortly after that, the city council uh, proceeded with a lawsuit and shutting us down. And when we challenged that, and when we, uh, we want to stay in the, the fourth district court of appeals in the state to open up and operate our business without any interruption with the city, the city reached out and circumvented the state courts to the department of justice and asked for assistance. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that we happened to us was we were raided, uh, on 11, one 11. And, uh, that was our first raid. We got three of them. Uh, so shortly after we were raided there, uh, the city reached out to the California Supreme court saying that our case regarding our zoning law was moot because we were shut down by the federal government. I told the, uh, my attorney, I said, you know, listen, you know, send a letter, I said, you know, can they dismiss the case? He said they could. Uh, so he doesn't really know. So uh, 
Roger John Diamond, who was our attorney at that time. And uh, he, I told him, go ahead and send a letter. I'm going to open back up. So I said, you know, it's more important for us to, you know, try to fight this case and, and see this through than it was, um, you know, for me, facing because after the raid and the guns and the, the kicking in the doors and the guns door ahead, uh, you know, they didn't arrest anybody. You know, they, everybody at that time, they were going in and stealing everything. And we were operating not only in compliance, but under the protection of the California courts. So, you know, I felt pretty, you know, passionate about what we were doing and how we were doing it. So uh, w once we were raided and once he, uh, we reopened, I reopened on, in January of 2012, I was visited by the DEA agent who came into the shop that time, uh, uh, Patrick Kelly, uh, young kid, uh, came in and said, you know, what are you doing? I just served you a uh, search warrant. I said, you know, what are you doing? Why are you doing the dirty business of the city? I don't understand why you're interfering with the case that's, you know, before the courts. I mean, I'm operating under the protection of the California courts. He says, I don't give a shit about your judges. I'm a fed. And I looked at him for a minute because I've never been in trouble before. I didn't know what was I was facing. That was a pinata, you know. So I literally looked at him in the face and I said, you know what? We don't have to do this. I'll come with you right now. He said, no, I'll be back. So after that, they sued the landlord, tried to seize the property uh, uh, from the landlord. I told this landlord, take me to court. It's California court. I'm operating in compliance with state law. I have, I disclosed what we were on the lease. There was nothing hidden. Uh, you know, as far as we were concerned, I said, it's important for you to do this because they will take your property if you don't. We went to California. We went to the courts, the, the, the San Bernardino County courts, and we won in court. So at the court case, the AUSA was there witnessing our trial, and I walked out to the out of the court, opened the door for him. I said, look, we don't have to do this. I don't understand why you're coming after me like this. And DEA agents, AUSA, they were trying to negotiate right there. Uh, I said, you know, look at Mr. Landlord. I understand you're going to have a problem, but I'll buy the building. I couldn't buy the building. We didn't have the money, but I said it in front of him because I knew they were listening. So they came, uh, came back. Uh, shortly after that, and on March 12th, they raided us again, once again, seized all of our assets, seized all of our, our medication, but didn't arrest anybody. So one of our, our uh, growers was across the street watching it because we were on Route 66. I was not hiding. I was operating a clandestine operation. You know, I was on Fit Foothill Boulevard, you know, Route 66. So uh, with banners saying open 24, you know, uh, seven days a week. So... Um, after that uh, second raid, one of the uh, guys that grew for us came in and I said, you know, we're going to stay open. I put the stuff back on the shelf. I did an interview saying, hey, we're still open. I, you know, I understand the DEA likes coming here. I'd encourage you patients to support us as well. So they played that and that didn't go over well with the DEA. So they came back and arrested me, kicked in the doors again on uh, July, June 12th. I went for a speedy trial because I thought it was important right then. It was 2012 when they were voting for legalization recreational in Washington. I went to trial in October of, of 2012. During the jury selection, they, kick, they get six kicks. I get nine kicks. They tried to make me a deal offering me five years of, of delayed sentence as long as I worked for them. I said, that's not a deal. That's a life sentence. I said, uh, let's go ahead and go with the uh, jury. They kicked off the first six deals, got rid of their six, and then one of the guys got up and said, this is atrocity, why are you going after Aaron? Everything was sidebarred after that, and the judge kicked off all the people that had medical marijuana cards. Because this is downtown LA in 2012. In the, an article in the LA Times recently had been published saying there were more marijuana shops in LA than there were Starbucks. I brought the article to the car, courthouse. So, uh, you know, when they, when they eliminated all of our medical marijuana holders, then they sat a jury and uh, the judge said, I understand that many of you are aware that marijuana has been legalized here in California, but in this courtroom, we enforce federal law and you will apply the law as I give it to you. I looked at my attorney. I said, yeah, it sounds like you convicted me right there. So all my evidence, all my witnesses and all my testimony was denied because it involved state law. The, the fact that I was operating under the protection of a California court was not allowed. The jury never knew that. So they ne all they were the hit with is one-sided. It was a three-day trial. 
them putting on one side of the trial, I was, I had no witnesses, no testimony, no nothing. And I was convicted and I was facing 10 to life because I had a, over a thousand plants uh, over a three year period. And I served my last 18 months in, in Florence, Colorado in the prison over there surrounded by marijuana farms. Every day the COs would come in and do their count. Uh, a few of them would love to chuckle. Did you smell that today? The wind blows a certain way, you could smell the cannabis in the air. And they said, can you tell what kind of cannabis was growing with that smell? So, I mean, this is what, the last 18 months was the toughest months, but uh, I, uh, I'm home now. I'm, uh, you know, I got out uh, just recently. And I'll tell you this, it's really surprising in all that time I've been gone in my area, it's really tough. It's a difficult situation over there. It was one of the last counties to come around and, and there's, they were fighting the, the law tooth and nail, even the state law. It hasn't changed much. I came back in many of the cities that I was in still don't have uh, any uh, cannabis uh, clubs in it and they haven't uh, developed any, any uh, uh, you know, uh, new uh, uh, guidelines for uh, licensing them. So it's kind of crazy. You know, I came out and it's almost like the same thing. But here I am, I'm glad to be here and thank you very much. And let's get out and go on where we need to go, right? Thank you. Okay, we're running a bit late, so I think we're going to uh, pretend like we had the 420 break or we can, you know, short-term memory loss. We had it, it was great. And so uh, Dale's got a little announcement to make and then we're gonna move on to the next panel, thank you.